There are two very significant transformations taking place in the board game industry today. The first transformation is from the physical world to the digital world. And the book industry has already experienced this transformation. As soon as the experience of reading a digital book rivaled that of reading a physical book, the transformation was cataclysmic. Um, Borders went out of business. Barnes and Nobles had to reinvent itself or do the same. Um, we're on the cusp of this transformation about to take place in the board game industry because the tablet PC is creating an experience which rivals that of playing physical board games. Um, this transformation is going to be cataclysmic because uh, the economics of manufacturing a game in China, of um, creating a cardboard box, gluing wrappers around it, making molds for plastic pieces, assembling them, putting uh, rules in there, forklifting it to a, to a truck, taking it to a ship, taking it to the US, putting it on a train, then a truck, bringing it to a warehouse, then out to distribution centers through the same process, then from the distribution centers out to a Target and Walmart, and having that game sit on a shelf until someone like you drives to the store, picks it up, puts it back in their car and drives home. That process is very expensive when compared to the process of someone sitting in their living room with a tablet clicking on buy and a game is immediately duplicated and within a minute it's transported onto their tablet PC. So this change is going to be cataclysmic for two reasons, the cost savings and because it's actually more convenient to have all of your games on a tablet. So when you're packing for a family vacation, you just take your tablet, not only do you have all of your games in your game closet, but you'll have your books, your movies, your music, uh, Facebook, YouTube, lots of other entertainment. So we're on the cusp of that transformation hitting our world because the experience of playing a board game with friends in your living room on a tablet is starting to rival the experience of playing that same board game in the same living room with the same friends, but you know, having physical components. The second transformation is, gets much less media attention. And it's actually more profound to the board game industry because it has to do with how games are designed. This transformation starts 30 years ago uh, in Germany at a convention where there's a design competition called the Spiel des Jahres. That means game of the year. Previous to this competition, game designers were anonymous. So I want to take just a quick poll here. A lot of you have probably heard of Monopoly, Scrabble, Clue. You've heard of a lot of board games. How many of you Raise your hand if you can think of the name of a board game designer. So I see one, two, so two people. So not very many. This is, and my guess is the two of you who've heard of it, you've probably heard of one of these terms, Spiel des Jahres, German games, Euro games. I see a yes and a yes, yeah. So that's kind of evidence of this slow transformation starting in Germany it took 10 or 15 years to kind of just touch into the mass market there, another 10 years to come to early adopters here. And it's just starting to come to uh, the mass market here. If you go to Barnes & Noble, they have four, book, uh, four game shelves. They've got strategy games, family games, uh, party games, and word games. If you look at the strategy game shelves, the box of every game on, well, most of the games on that shelf will have the name of the designer prominently displayed. And if you go to the other four, uh, three game shelves, there will be no names of the designers on those boxes. So for the rest of you, I'm not surprised that you haven't heard of any game designer. If you go and pick up Monopoly, there's no designer on the box. Um, this is interesting because Hasbro, Mattel, Milton Bradley, uh, the big game companies taken in aggregate have about 200 game designers. They come into work every day, they clock in in the morning, they design games, they clock out in the afternoon, and yet none of the games that any of you can name were designed in-house. So not Monopoly, Clue, Trivial Pursuit, Risk, Stratego, um, Taboo, you name it. None of those games were designed by the 200 people that go to work every single day, clock in and clock out. Instead, they were developed by people who have full-time jobs, were passionate about a hobby, and did a hobby on the side at night and on the weekends. So all of those games have an author who designed them that were outside of the in-house. And I find this very interesting. So I've really tried to analyze, like, what is it about these two different ways of developing games makes it so that one creates all of the greatest hits of the last century and the other doesn't create anything that anyone here would ever have heard of. Um, so I've, I've thought about what would happen if you went to Barnes & Noble or a bookstore and you picked up a book and there was no author on it. None of the books had authors on it. You would look at the book and you'd go, oh, I guess it was uh, written by Random House Publishing. 
And this type of uh, anonymity uh, does several things for the author. One, let's say the author puts their passion into a, a book and creates Harry Potter, all right? Um, they would not receive any of the upside from the sales. They might get a bonus of a few thousand dollars, but they wouldn't get the billions of dollars of value that have been created from this brand. So they have no, no upside potential. On the downside, no one's heard of them. So they couldn't even take their business elsewhere. They don't have a fan base of people who want to see the next Harry Potter book. So they have uh, no job security on the downside. So this is kind of what was taking place in the board game industry. And so the quality of games from the people who clock in to, and out to the people who are passionate about their hobby was significant enough that all of the greatest hits of the last century come from the, the hobbyists. Well, there's the same gap quality from uh, people who are passionate about their hobby and people who are passionate about their full-time profession. So I want to go back to this uh, game design competition called the Spiel des Jahres and what it's done to the industry. First of all, the award is not given to a publisher. It's given to a designer. And his name is always prominently displayed on the box. So he's building a fan base of people who want to see his next game, just like people want to see Tom Cruise's next movie or Stephen King's next book. He's building a brand which will, that he can take with him. And he can ask for about double the percentage of royalties as someone who's a no-name. Um, there's financial benefits. The winner of this award will earn between a half a million dollars and five, 10, 15, up to $20 million for the sales of that game that wins the Spiel des Jahres. And so these two things coupled together have brought in an influx of a lot of talent into the industry. And more importantly, it's created a growing class of self-employed professional game designers. And this is very important. The self-employed part means that they're taking risks like an entrepreneur. So if they produce a bad work, they'll earn nothing for it. They won't be able to sell it. And if they produce a bestseller, they can earn millions. That risk that an entrepreneur brings to their, to their passion, to their hobby, um, drives them to get better at their craft. And so they'll put in 70, 80, 90, 100 hours a week for the first five or 10 years of their career, just like a normal entrepreneur, in order to hone their craft and to master it. Um, it's very exciting when you have that risk that's pushing you forward and you have other people who are doing in the same boat. There's a lot of cross-fertilization of ideas. Um, there are about 100 game design conventions that have cropped up over the last 10 years. So this is where people get, game designers get together just like writers and they workshop their works. And the craft of designing games has improved significantly over the last 30 years. And so I want to give just a few tangible examples. When game designers get together, they talk about two very important things. What was fun about the game we just played and what was not fun? And they want to find ways to make the game more fun and to remove the parts that are not fun. Um, so here's some things that are not fun. Waiting for your turn is not fun. So something, so people, so, and yet like with Trivial Pursuit or, or um, Monopoly or Risk, you might have to wait 5, 10, 15 minutes for your turn. So what they would do is, let's just take Trivial Pursuit, any modern game coming out now, they would, if they ask a trivia question, everyone would answer the question at the same time. Either blurt out the answer or write down the answer. Uh, here's another thing that's not fun. Watching other people play a game and have fun, but not being allowed to participate. That is not fun. Um, yet in Monopoly and Risk, two of the best sellers of the last century, you can get eliminated within the first 30 minutes of the game and not allowed to play, and all you can do is sit and watch while your friends have fun. Um, this gets compiled by another problem which a lot of games have from the last century, um, unpredictable play times. So if you're trying to get someone to play Monopoly with you, you don't know if it's going to take an hour and a half or six, eight hours. Usually people don't even finish the game. And that gets compiled. You could have just gotten knocked out of the game and now you don't know if you're going to have to sit and watch your friends play for 30 minutes or six hours. So these are just some examples of poor game design which you will never find in this new crop of games that are coming out right now. Um, this space is crowded, so to stand out, you increasingly need to do more than just become a master at the craft. And this, these new professional self-employed game designers are increasingly seeing themselves as artists. So they look inside themselves and they think, what is captivating to me, or what do I find fun, and why do I find this fun? And is there something common to me and what it is about 
me that's common to all of humanity and how can I find an activity which is common to people and then use my craft of board game design to build a very simple rule set that gets people participating in this activity that's fun. Um, so I just kind of want to wrap it up with uh, looking back at these two transformations. They're one, we're on the cusp of this cataclysmic transformation that's gonna make or break companies. It's gonna get a lot of media of attention. And we're also at the, I'm not sure where, in the process of this slow transformation that's affecting uh, board game design itself, creating kind of a renaissance of board games. And these two transformations together, coupled together, are providing ample opportunity for this new class of entrepreneurs to reinvent the board game genre, to create games like fantasy sports, and to produce some of the best works that we've ever seen in the history of games. So, thank you.